Okay, so the holiday coming up is the 15th day of the month of Av. So we're in the Jewish month of Av, and today is the, is the 13th day of Av, and coming up is the 15th day, which is the day of love and rebirth. So it says here, the 15th of Av is undoubtedly a most mysterious day because a search of the Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law, reveals no observances or customs for this date, except for the instruction that Tachanun, the, the confession of sins and similar portions should be omitted from the daily prayers, as is the case with all festive dates, and that one should increase one's study of Torah since the nights are beginning to grow longer and the night was created for study. And the Talmud tells us that many years ago, the daughters of Jerusalem would go dance in the vineyards on the 15th of Av, and whoever did not have a wife would go there to find himself a bride. And Tal the Talmud considers this the greatest festival of the year. The greatest festival of the year with Yom Kippur a close second. Indeed, the 15th of Av cannot but be a mystery, as the full moon of the tragic month of Av it is the festival of the future redemption, and thus a day whose essence, by definition, is unknowable to our unredeemed self. Yet also the unknowable is also ours to seek and explore, and so I'd like to explore a little bit with you here. So we'll start out with the seven joyous events that happen on the 15th of Av. Number one, the dancing maidens of Jerusalem. Said Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, there was no greater festival for Israel than the 15th of Av and Yom Kippur. On these days, the daughters of Jerusalem would go out and dance in the vineyards. And what would they say? Young man. This is very important, so pay attention to this part here. Young man. This is what they would say. Young man, raise your eyes and see which you select for yourself. Okay, that's an important little piece there. We'll get back to that a little bit later. The Talmud goes on to list several joyous events which occurred on the 15th day of the month of Av. So what happened? So that's not really a joyous event. That, I mean, that's not a historical event that happened. That was just the day that the women would go out, uh, out and tell the young man, raise your eyes and see what you select for yourself. Number two, the dying of the generation of the Exodus ceased. Several months after the people of Israel were freed from Egyptian slavery, the incident of the spies demonstrated their unpreparedness for the task of conquering land Canaan and developing it as a holy land. So God decreed that the entire generation would die out of the desert and that their children would enter the land instead of them. After 40 years of wandering through the desert, the dying finally ended, and a new generation of Jews stood ready to enter the holy land. It was the 15th of Av of the year 2487 from creation. Uh, so what doesn't say here, and I'll just add in, was that the day that everybody would die was on Tisha B'Av. So on Tisha B'Av, all the people who were supposed to die that year would die, and then the last year, they didn't die. So then they knew that those would, be, those would be the ones to go in. So it was on, on the 15th of Av that it was, they realized that we're no longer, no one's going to die anymore in the desert. The third thing was the tribes of Israel were permitted to intermarry. You may not have known that, that the tribes of Israel were not allowed to marry into any other tribe. And that was because they wanted to make sure that the division of the Holy Land, the way it was divided up between the 12 tribes of Israel, they would stay in their families. And so therefore restrictions had been placed on marriages between members of two different tribes. A woman who had inherited tribal lands from her father was forbidden to marry out of her tribe because if she would marry out, then her children, members of their father's tribe, would cause a transfer of land from one tribe to another 
by inheriting her estate. This ordinance was binding on the generation that conquered and settled the Holy Land. When the restriction was lifted on the 15th of Av, the event was considered a cause of self for celebration and festivity. Uh, what I did not look up, and I do apologize for that, is why they no longer were concerned about the tribal land being transferred. I don't know the answer to that, but they took away that rule, and therefore they were allowed to... So the fourth thing, or really the third, is, and it's really, it's really, three and four are really the same thing, they're very similar. The tribe of Benjamin was permitted to re-enter the community. What happened to the tribe of, of Benjamin? Now, that's a long story, and uh, that could be a, ni a nice learning experience, because there was an incident that happened called the Concubine of Giva. It's a very, very gory story, and because of it, the, uh, the entire tribe of Benjamin was excommunicated for its behavior in that incident. And then on the 15th of Av, they readmitted them into the community of Israel. So basically, they killed a whole bunch of them. It was a civil war. And um, they killed many of the people in the tribe of Benjamin. And they made a rule that no one was allowed to marry anyone from the tribe of Benjamin. And so it got to a point where there were not enough girls. And, and the, the men had no one to marry. And it was a real, it was a real uh, disaster about to happen. And... Um, they said, okay, on the 15th of Av, they allowed them to say, okay, we take away the excommunication, and they brought them back into allowing them to uh, marry into the Jewish people. Hosea ben Ela opened the roads of Jerusalem. This is the uh, third thing, really, that happened. And that was, again, a very, very sad part of our history that became more positive. And that is... Very, very sadly, so the, the Temple of Israel is built by King Solomon, and, it's, and so they only have the temple for a couple of years, and then Solomon passes away. Well, after he passes away, his son Rechavam takes over and doesn't do a good job. He raises taxes, and because of that, there's a, a, um, there's a breakaway by a man by the name of Yeravam ben Nevat. So Yeravam ben Nevat uh, breaks away from the, the Davidic dynasty, from King Solomon's son, and sets up his own northern kingdom of Israel. But he goes even further. He sets up roadblocks, and he doesn't allow anyone from the northern kingdom to go and visit Jerusalem, to go and visit the holy temple in Jerusalem. So the temple isn't really that old, and, um, and the Jews can't go. And who's stopping them? Jews. Jews won't let Jews go to Jerusalem. So we thought we have it bad today that Jews don't get along with each other. No. Uh, you, if, if you think we're, happy, it's, hey, we're having a hard time getting along today, you simply are unaware of Jewish history. So for 200 years, for 200 years, Jews were not allowed to go to Jerusalem unless you were part of the Davidic uh, kingdom. Kingdom of David versus the Kingdom of Israel, and not only that, they built a um, they built an alternative temple in the um, in the north of Israel, where you can go and visit it today, and they worshipped idols there. So this is what was going on in in Israel just a few years after the temple was built. So for hundreds of years, there's no temple. All of a sudden, there's a temple, and then the war, the the uh, the, the um, Roads to Jerusalem are cut off. Now, just let me just explain to you why he didn't want them going to the temple. And that's because of a very interesting law. And that law is that in the, the, in the Azara, which is the courtyard of the temple, the only people who were allowed to sit there were the kings of David and their, and their descendants. But someone who was the king of Israel would not be allowed to sit. So it would be obvious to anyone there by seeing that the king of David was sitting and the king of Israel was standing, it would be obvious to everybody who was the real king. And so since they did not want to expose themselves to that, they just forbid anybody from going. Well, two, more than 200 years later, Hosea ben Elah, the last king of the northern kingdom, 
finally took them down and removed those uh, those uh, roadblocks and allowed them to finally uh, go. And shortly thereafter, this is this is the tragic our tragic history. Shortly thereafter, the ten tribes were exiled from Israel. So they finally are allowed to go back, and then they get conquered and taken away and uh, scattered around the world. Uh, still, many of them not found yet. Okay, uh, another very sad event that happened that, end, that had a happy ending, and that is the dead of Betar were allowed to be buried. And so what happened was, uh, after the temple was destroyed, the second temple was destroyed, there, was a, there were quite a few rebellions against the Romans to try to reclaim the land of Israel. Well, one fellow was very, very successful, and his name was Bar Kokhba. And it, that means the son of the star. That's because in the Torah, it refers to Mashiach as a star will come out of David. And so the reason he was called Bar Kokhba is because they thought he was the Mashiach, because he did everything that Mashiach was supposed to do. He, he, uh, he beat the Romans, he chased them out, he, 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 they even minted coins, uh, and they created their own autonomy. It was the first time the Jews were autonomous in their land for hundreds of years, because even during the entire Second Temple period, they really didn't have autonomy. Here they finally had their own autonomy, and they thought Mashiach had come. But even, even Rabbi Akiva said he was Mashiach. And Rabbi Akiva carried his, uh, his bag, his, uh, his weapons for him, his, uh, whatever, carried his, his suitcase for him. But uh, Bar Kokhba was not to be Mashiach. He wasn't Mashiach. And um, he was later named Bar Kuziva, which means the son of the lie, because he was the false one. And so he was the false one. And uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews were killed. And... Um, the, the Romans massacred the survivors of the battle with great cruelty. It says there was a river of blood that, that, um, that was flowing out of Betar. And on top of it, they didn't allow the Jews to bury anyone. And so for years and years and years, they let them be that way. And then finally, uh, they allowed them to be buried. And it was the 15th of the month of Av. So you can see the date. So 133 was the year that they were that they were killed, and in 148, uh, about uh, 15 years later, is when they were allowed to actually uh, bury them. And to thank God for the miracle that they were finally allowed to bury them, they added an entire additional fourth blessing to the grace after meals, which we say every single time we eat bread, we add in a special prayer thanking God for this wonderful opportunity to be able to bury the dead of Betar. It's uh, quite, quite, uh, quite something. Okay, the last, so the fifth, really the fifth of the, uh, of the events that happened on the 15th of August, the day of the breaking of the axe. Doesn't, that's not as exciting as it sounds. Uh, so when the temple, Holy Temple stood in Jerusalem, the annual cutting of firewood for the altar was concluded on the 15th day of the month of Av. The event was celebrated with feasting and rejoicing as the custom upon the conclusion of a holy endeavor and included a ceremonial breaking of the axes, which gave the day its name. So they would break the axes that they would use to chop down some of the trees. And the reason was because the wood was going to start getting too dry and therefore would get wormy. So therefore, they would stop around this time uh, using any, they would only chop wood until this point, and they would use that wood the entire year for the actual temple. So here, these are the five events, the breaking of the axe, the burying of the dead in Betar, the uh, opening the roads to Jerusalem, the allowing the tribe of Benjamin to, uh, to marry within, the, within, the, within Israel, the tribes, all the tribes of Israel were able to intermarry. It's going to be the same one. And then the fifth one is that the Jews stopped dying in the desert. Um, now, the dancing of the maidens in Jerusalem, there was a couple of interesting things to go along with that, and that is that the women would all wear white, and they would not wear their own clothing, and they would say, don't look at the clothing because it's not mine. So you don't know. You don't know if I'm rich. You don't know if I'm poor. Uh, you don't know anything about me, about my external 
look on the inside and choose me for who I am rather than the external trappings around me. So um, one of the, just to give you the, the facetic insight into this, uh, into this holiday as to why it is such a great day, and that is because the idea of the young daughters of the women going out there, there it's a metaphor for the Jewish people, and young man is a reference to God. So it wasn't that the women were turning, obviously they were trying to get married, which would be a wonderful thing. But most importantly, what they were doing was they were saying, uh, young men, they were turning to God and saying, raise your eyes and see what you select for yourself, meaning choose the Jewish people the way you promised us so many years ago. So we were referring to God as young men because God can appear in many, many different, many different ways. And it says that uh, at, the, at the time of the, of the crossing of the sea, God appeared to the Jewish people as a young man. And so um, this is really, this is the time to, uh, to the idea of the Tanya that we are studying. This is the idea of a relationship. And uh, so relationships is really the, 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 the theme of the day, because the whole idea of Tisha B'Av, the whole idea of the, breaking of the temple was that our, our marriage kind of uh, got, um, you know, was, uh, was on the rocks and we had a bit of, we had a big falling out with God and uh, the house burned down, basically the institution of our home, of our relationship with God kind of fell apart and we had to now go deeper to rebuild that relationship with God. And so on a spiritual level, it's really building our relationship with Hashem but it's also a day that we focus on relationships themselves. So we're going to be having some uh, discussion uh, with some uh, authors who have written books on the subject and have done uh, many, um, many seminars. So we've got the Grossmans will be on. And we have my classmate and very, very, very close friend, childhood friend from Yeshiva, Rabbi Ari Lane, the Chabad Rabbi in Panama City, Panama, who will come on. And so it should be an interesting uh, evening. That's going to be uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m. And so with that, um, first of all, I want to say hello to everybody because some people came on, uh, didn't get to see you before. So uh, hello, Janet. Hello, Gabby. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Leonard. Hello, Michael. Hello, Tim. Hello, Ina. Hello, Adam. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Michael Kaufman. Hello, Jerry. Hello, Alita. Hello, Rena. Hello, Lois. Hello, Selma. So good to see all of you and learn together with you. And so for tonight, I thought we are going to be studying the Tanya. But before we go to the actual Tanya that we're going to be studying tonight, I thought it would be important for us to first, because he's going to reference the blessings before the Shema. So I thought we'd take a few moments and just read through them so that we have the context and then we'll go inside and we'll understand the questions and the answers that he gives and the context in which he reframes the blessings of the Shema. Now, uh, with a raise of hands, how many of you would be interested in a class on the prayer book that we would go through the prayers and try to understand, not the, just the... Uh, you know, not the, um, I don't want to spend forever on each little prayer, but kind of go through it and to really get a sense of that. So if you could just uh, raise your hand, let me know that you're interested. Okay, very good. Looks like this class would be, um, and uh, now we're looking for a time. It's probably going to be a morning because all of our evenings are all eaten up. So it's probably going to be a morning. So if you could put it in the chat, when would be a good, oh, thanks. Um, so if you could put in the chat, when would work for you, if that's possible in a morning, or I mean, you can always watch the videos afterwards, but um, we're kind of out of evenings. That's so much going on at Chabad, but uh, we're looking to do a morning or early afternoon or noon or something like that. So that would be a, a possibility. And I'm thinking of actually blending it together with uh, Alita's request of the 60-day book. And um, we could do that as well. So I just want to put a, a plug out there for the book, 60 Days. If you don't have it, I would strongly recommend that you get it. Um, so you can get it online. You can get it on 
Amazon. You can get it on uh, Meaningful Life. It's a 60-day book, and it, we, it covers from the, the entire month of Elul through the entire month of Tishrei. So it's 60 days. And uh, we're going to be try, we're going to try to go through that book um, as well. So uh, we'll try to pair those things up together. I think that'd be a lot of fun to do that. So we're uh, looking into that. So it looks like we got some interest from this group. I know I have other people that are interested as well. But uh, get that 60 book, that 60 day book. That's going to be very, very good, very helpful. Um, also, if you don't have a prayer book at home, I am recommending to people to get this book, this prayer book. It's uh, it's the, it's a Chabad prayer book, but the translation in it has an interpolated commentary that goes along with it, and it's much easier to um, much easier to relate to the. Um, it's much easier to relate to the subject of the prayer book with this. I've been using it every single uh, every single week on Shabbat when I pray. I use this book, so I'm just telling you from personal experience. It really helps uh, fill in the the uh, fill in a lot of the meaning of the of the prayers. It really helps out. I'm definitely going to use this one um, for our class and figure out how to get it on there or whatever. So that's another one. It's the it's on the Quixote. Uh, it's on the Quixote um, uh, website, and it is the Weiss edition prayer book. So it's the Sidur, and it's the Weiss edition, and uh, we're going to be using that one for that class. But I will send out an email with that information. Okay, and thank you very much, all those who are putting in the chat. Um, okay, looks like, uh, okay, I guess uh, there will be no time that would be perfect for everybody, so uh, <laughs> I do apologize if it's not going to work for you, but I will do my best to try to make this, uh, this work for everybody. Um, okay, now I am going to share my screen with a resource that you might find very interesting that might be something a little hard to find on Chabad.org. But a, I've been using this book as well, so um, I've, been, I've been doing a lot, of, a lot of praying and a lot of finding fun things on, uh, on prayer. So I do look forward to sharing these with you. Um, so this is the, called the Online Sidur with Commentary. And it's on Chabad.org. You can hide the commentary, or you can show the commentary. And it just has the prayers with it. It's a, simple, it's a very simple translation. It's this translation from the Chabad prayer book that we use in, in Chabad, which I think is way too short and doesn't really give you the full, the full picture. And then it has this commentary here. That's very, um, very intriguing and interesting. Um, so we're going to be doing this. I'm going to hide the commentary because for today, we just want to go through this blessings of the Shema. So I can't wait to do the prayer, the, the prayer class because it's, I, I'm just enjoying it so much more now that I've had more time to pray at a slower pace and to read up more. So I can't wait to do this. And um, I have a little treat. I'm going to tell you guys. Uh, I think the first couple of classes, my father is, I'm going to ask my father to give. And he has agreed to be giving some of those classes. So uh, we have a treat there, having my father give um, some classes for us. So that's, um, that's exciting. So here comes the blessings of the Shema. So the prayer has a kind of a, a, a praise part, which is the first part. We have a blessing before, a blessing after, and then we have the blessings of the Shema. And it starts off as follows. Blessed are you, God, our Lord, King of the universe, who forms light and creates darkness, who makes peace and creates all things. So now we're going to thank God for the things that God creates. What does God create? And the answer is, I went the wrong way. Whoops. I don't know, my previous from my next. 
sorry. And so we have the, this is thanking God for the sun and the moon, who mercilessly shines light to the earth and those who dwell upon it. In his goodness, he renews the work of creation every day continuously. How many fold are your works, O God? You have made them all with wisdom. The earth is filled with your possessions, things that, um, that follow and do everything you want. You are the king who alone is exalted from the beginning of time, was praised, glorified, and appraised from the beginning of creation. God of the universe, in your abundant mercies, have mercy upon us, for you are the master of our strength, rock of our refuge, shield of our salvation, a refuge for us. The blessed God, great in understanding, prepared and brought about the rays of the sun. The generous one created glory for his name. He placed luminaries around his power. The chieftains of his hosts are holy beings. Now he switches from the sun and the moon, and now he switches over to the angels. The chieftains of his hosts are holy beings. So who's in charge up there? Those are holy beings, they're angels, who exalt the, omnip the omnipotent continuously, relating the glory of God and his holiness. Now there is an opinion that this is actually still referring to the sun and the moon and to all the stars, that they also are conscious beings and they continuously relate the glory of God. That's another, another understanding of that. Be blessed, God our God, in heaven above and on the earth below, for all of your praiseworthy handiwork and for the shining luminaries that you have formed. May they glorify you forever. So we're thanking God for all the wonderful things that he created in the sky above us, in the heavens. And not only in the sky, but also in the heavens, meaning the angels. And we're going to continue with the angels now. These are the things that God created. And so we go now to be blessed for eternity, our rock, our king, and our redeemer, the creator of holy beings. May your name be praised forever. Our king who creates ministering angels and whose ministering angels all stand in the lofty heights of the universe and loudly proclaim in awe together the words of the living God, the eternal king. All of them are beloved. All the angels are beloved. All of them are pure, all are mighty, and all are holy. All carry out the will of their creator with dread and awe. All of them open their mouths in holiness and purity with song and music and bless, praise, glorify, extol, sanctify, and ascribe kingship to the name of the Almighty, the great, powerful, and awesome King who is holy. They all accept from themselves the yoke of the kingdom of heaven one from another. And they all lovingly grant permission to each other to sanctify their maker with a gracious spirit, with refined speech, and with a sacred melody. Together, they all exclaim with dread and declare in awe, Holy, holy, holy is the God of, the ho of hosts. The entire earth is filled with his glory. And the Ophanim, the lower level of angels, and the Holy Chayas, the lowest level of angels, rise up toward the Seraphim, the highest level of angels, with a great clamor, and in their manner offer praise and declare. So they don't say Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. That's too high for them. Instead, they say the following, Blessed be the glory of God from its place. And we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later as to why the difference, why one of them says holy, 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 and the other one just says, Blessed be the glory of God from its place. They offer sweet melodies to the blessed God, these angels, to the Almighty King who is living and abiding. They recite songs and pronounce praise, for He alone is exalted and holy, performing mighty deeds, bringing about new developments, the master of wars, meaning he, he controls the outcome of all wars. He sows righteousness, causes deliverance to sprout forth, and creates cures. He is awesome in praise, the master of wonders, who in his goodness renews every day continuously the work of creation. I don't know if you, know, if you knew, realize this, but it says this twice in this blessing who in his goodness renews every day continuously the work of creation. So this is a very important theme in this blessing, that God is renewing it constantly. As it is said, give thanks to the one who makes the great luminaries, not the one who made 
the great luminaries, for his kindness is everlasting. Blessed are you, God, creator of the luminaries, and that concludes the first blessing before the Shema. And we talk about the great things that God created in the heaven, in the physical heavens, and in the spiritual heavens, the angels. The next blessing is Ahavat Olam, which is the Chabad version of this. There are other versions of this, which is Ahava Rabbah. But our version is Ahavat Olam, which means an everlasting love. You have loved us, God our God, with everlasting love. You have bestowed upon us an abundant and exceeding measure of compassion. Our Father, our King. Oops, sorry, I gotta focus on this here for a second. You have bestowed upon us an abundant and exceeding measure. So exceeding is always in reference to something else. That's gonna be one of the questions Al Tareb is going to ask is exceeding compared to what? an exceeding measure of compassion. Our Father, our King, for the sake of your great name and for the sake of our ancestors who trusted in you, whom you taught life-giving laws by which to fulfill your will wholeheartedly, be likewise gracious to us and instruct us. So you chose us, you loved us, please continue to love us. Our Father, merciful Father, who shows mercy, have mercy upon us and implant understanding in our hearts so that we may lovingly comprehend and perceive, listen, learn, and teach, observe, perform, and maintain all the words of the teachings of your Torah. Enlighten our eyes with your Torah. Cause our hearts to cleave to your commandments and unify our hearts to love and fear your name. And may we never be shamed or disgraced or falter. For we have placed our trust in your holy, great, and awesome name. May we celebrate and rejoice in your salvation. May your mercy, O God, our Lord, and your abundant kindness never forsake us. Hasten and speedily bring us blessing and peace. Bring us in peace from the four corners of the world. Break off the yoke of the nations from our necks and speedily lead us upright to our land. For you are God who brings our about acts of salvation and you have chosen us from all nations and tongues. And you, our King of Lovely, brought us close to your great name so that we may thankfully acknowledge you, proclaim your oneness, love, and love your name. Blessed are you, God who chooses his people Israel with love. So this one is all about how God chooses us with love. And so those are the two, the two, um, the two blessings that precede the Shema. And now we will go to chapter 49 in Tanya. And for that, he's going to now ask the question here. Thereby, by understanding what we understood before, we will understand the true reason and meaning of the rabbinical enactment ordaining the recitations of the blessings of the Shema. Two preceding it. For it would appear at first glance that they have no connection whatever with the recital of the Shema. As Rajva and other codifiers have stated, that if you did not say the blessings of the Shema before the Shema, let's say you were in a rush, and you didn't have time to actually say the blessings before the Shema, and it was later on in the day, you say them later on in the day because they're independent of the Shema. They're not like, well, if you said the Shema already, what's the point of saying the blessings? Like, if you ate, if you ate bread and uh, hours later you, uh, you remember that you haven't eaten and you forgot to make a blessing, do you make a blessing on the bread? The answer is no. You do not make a blessing on the bread because the bread has already been eaten. So what are you making a blessing on? It's already, it's already been eaten. So if the blessings of the Shema are like, eat, like the blessing you make before bread, well then once you said the Shema, there would be no need to say the blessing. But if the saying of, the, of, the, of these blessings is independent of the Shema, well, then if you missed it, you still have to say the blessings because they're independent of it. And that's exactly how Jewish law codifies it, that it actually is that way. You need to, um, you need to go ahead and re-say the Shema. So why are we saying these blessings before the Shema? What's the connection? If it's not a blessing on the Shema, why did they put it here? One is talking about that God chose the Jewish people, and one of them talks about that uh, God made the sun and the moon. 
why why isn't that part of the earlier parts of the of the prayer, which is connected with uh, thanking God for all the wonderful things He does for us? We can thank Him for the angels. We can thank Him for the uh, for them for the sun and the moon. We can thank Him for choosing us. So that's what the Alter is going to address here in this end of this chapter forty nine, which we are going to explore together. And so let's see it here. So why were they ordained to be recited specifically before the Shema? And here comes the Alter Rebbe to give us an insight into the Shema itself as to what the point of the Shema is. And then we will understand why we have these blessings to proceed. And we'll read it inside. But the reason is that the essence of the recital of the Shema is to fulfill the obligation that we should serve God with all your heart. Which means with both your natures. So what is the simple meaning of that? When we say, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. So the word heart is levavecha. And so we understand from there um, that levavecha means with both your hearts. Now, we didn't know we had two hearts. We only have one heart. I mean, we have two parts of the heart, but we have only one heart. So what does it mean two hearts? So therefore, the Talmud says what it means is the two inclinations of your heart. So your heart has in, is, is inclined to two different places. One is to God, and the other one is to the opposite of God. So the question is, what does it mean to love God with all your heart? So traditionally, it's understood that, especially in Chabad, Hasidic teachings, that what does it mean to serve God or to love God with all your heart? It means to love God even with your evil inclination, that you should work in getting your animating soul to love God also. So that's traditionally what Hasidus always says is the meaning of this. But here the Alter Rebbe says a different meaning. And so it's important to understand what the Alter Rebbe is saying here, because he's saying something different. And what he's saying is here, is that is to say, here we are, what does it mean with both your natures? It means, that is to say, to overcome anything that deters you from the love of God. So, what does it mean when we say that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart? It means to love God despite the fact that your heart is being pulled in another direction. Where is your heart being pulled? For your heart alludes to the wife and children. To whom a man's heart is by his very nature bound. So we have a natural love that we have in our hearts for our spouse and for our children. So have the rabbis of blessed memory commented on the verses for he, not spake, for he spoke and it came to pass. This refers to the wife. And he commanded and it stood fast. This refers to the children. That means that we know in the wild animal, in the, in the animal kingdom, there are many animals that do not have a love for their children or for their spouse. There are many animals that they just mate, they, and, they, and they go off. They go looking for somebody else. They don't mate for life. You know, we have doves that mate for life, and we have others that mate for life, but uh, most animals do not. And those who mate for life uh, necess don't necessarily both love the children, and so on. And so God made it a, uh, a law that that parents would love their children and that spouses would love each other. So basically, 
we have the opposite problem of what they had a long time ago. So a long time ago, the problem that they had was that people loved their spouse and their children so much that they got in the way of loving God. Today, we have a, maybe we have the opposite problem. That there are some people who don't love their children and spouse enough. So uh, that's um, that might be a, a, a that's a that's a sign of of a, of a problem. In other words, what the Torah is saying is that naturally we should love our spouse and we should love our children. So if we see a society or we see within society that there is a breakdown in the family structure. We should know that that's going against the nature. So the nature is that healthy. Obviously, we can do, we can, we can design it. We can break away from the nature that God gave us, you know, for good and for the opposite of good. So if God gave us a negative nature, we could go away from that and we could become more positive. And if we were given a good nature, we could move away from that and become negative. That's that's up to us. That's our free choice. So God gave us this natural inclination that we would love our spouse and love our children. Now, we wouldn't necessarily love them because God told us to love them. We just love them because we're naturally attracted to them or naturally feel an affinity to them or feel that they, they're, they're close to us and so on. So it's not coming necessarily from our love of God, and therefore we could get in the way of our love of God. But if someone loves their wife and their children precisely because God wants us to love our wife and our children, not because God made it our nature, but because God commanded us to do it, that's very, very different. So he's not talking about that. He's talking about the love that we have that we don't ascribe to God. It is the love that we naturally have that God gave to us, that God implanted within us that naturally we would love, um, that we would love our spouse and our children. And so what happens is we have now, uh, we have a conflict. We have competing love. Now, if you love your spouse and your children because God told you to love them, then there's no conflict between the love of God and love of your spouse and love of your children. But if you love your spouse and children because you love them, and, you, and now you're supposed to love God, well, that's going to get in the way. Because there's things that I love, and then there's, uh, i got to split that love between uh, me and God, you know, uh, between God and, and my spouse. Rabbi? Yeah. Isn't this, this is, reminds me of the explanation that I, that I got for the mechitza. Because if, you're, if there's a man, and he's sitting with his wife and his children in synagogue, then he's, his, he's supposed to be paying attention to them. Right. Not to God. Is that right. the explanation? It's kind of like that, yeah. Okay. That's what it reminds me of. Yes, yes. So if, if your love of God translates into your love of your spouse and love of your children, then it's healthy, and it's the way it's supposed to be. I remember the, um, the Rebbe's doctor, uh, Rabbi Dr. Weiss, um, he shared that... Um, some of the private things that the Rebbe told him after he had his heart attack, the Rebbe shared his, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things with the doctor. Because he would spend a lot of private time with the Rebbe. And um, he noticed that the Rebbe would spend every day a half hour where he would drink tea with his, uh, with his wife. And uh, he t the Rebbe told him that his drinking, is spending a half hour of time with his wife every day, and uh, sipping tea with her and just spending time with her was as important, if not even more important, than him putting on tefillin every day. And so the idea that, that, that spending time with your spouse is a biblical commandment, is a, an obligation, just like it's a mitzvah in the Torah, it is a mitzvah. So then what it does is it connects to you to your spouse bigger than yourself. Because if it's coming from you, well, then there's a limit to it, and it also it could turn sour, and it could the love could uh, could go away. But if it's because of a mitzvah, well, a mitzvah is done. The whole point of a mitzvah is that you do it whether you're in the mood or not. It's called a commandment. Commandment means 
I don't want to do it. If you, if you want to do something, it's not, you don't have to be commanded to do it. And so a commandment means that I'm committing myself that I'm going to do it no matter what, which really that's the idea of marriage. Marriage is that, that idea of commitment that I will be that way regardless of how I feel. So the same thing, if a person's love of his family and love of his, uh, is, is because of himself, well, then that's, that's limited and it's, it has a, there's a, there is a chance, there is a possibility that it will not last. But if it comes from a place of commitment, a commandment, well, then that's going to completely transform and change the dynamic here. So that's why he's not talking about that. He's addressing the love of children and the love of spouse. That's uh, not the kind of love, a selfless love. It's a selfish love. Now, not selfish in a bad way, but still selfish. And that is... This is my wife. This is my children. Um, this is my spouse, which is, uh, you know, so if it works and you, and because it's your spouse, therefore you take such good care of the, of your spouse. Okay, good. It works. Um, if you, you take good care of your children because they're your children, good. It works, but that's not the ideal. That's not the, that's not the highest level because ultimately it's all about you. It's really all about you. My, this is my spouse, this is my children, um, as opposed to this is my responsibility. That's a very different way of looking at it. So I get married because of my needs or do I get married because of my spouse's needs? So am I focused on what I need or am I focused on what my spouse needs? So if I'm focused on my needs, okay, well, you're either serving my needs or you're not serving my needs. And you know, at some point, you're not serving my needs enough, and it's not worth putting up with all of your mishigas. So, uh, so goodbye. I'm, uh, I gotta say, I gotta, I gotta say goodbye. But if I get married on the premise that I am here to serve, I am here to serve your needs because God has instructed me and created me so that I could take care of you, and God gave me these children so that I could take care of them and I could be their parents and I could raise them and do what God wants of me for them. That's a very, very different place where you are coming from, which is why there would be no conflict between that kind of love of your spouse and children and love of God. But if your love of your spouse and love of your children comes from a possessive kind of love, this is my family, this is my children, it's all about me, and I'm so proud of them, and I'm so uh, invested in them because of how much it me and how much they reflect on me and how much it means to me and so on, so that selfishness is will get in the way because now I've got two competing things. I got to take, I got to protect my family. I got to take care of my family. They're my family. Yes, of course you have to do that. But if, if you're doing it because of as an obligation, because God gave it to you, well, then you're serving God. But if you're doing it out because it's your family, well, then God is getting in the way of my family and therefore it's a conflict. So when I'm done taking care of my family, then I'll spend some time with, with God. So that's the, that's, the, that's the conflict over here that we're having between family and God. So that's why he says that what does it mean to love God? Love God means you have to overcome the obstacles that deter us from the love of God. So what are those things that would get in the way? And so the first thing is, he says, with all your heart. What is the things that you are by nature bound to them. Who did God make you love? Your wife and your children. God made you love them. And so that is the, that is the issue. Now, if, what's the rest of the things there that get in the way of our, um, our love of God? So the next part is with all your soul. What does it mean with all your soul? that sometimes you're going to have to literally put your life on the line for God because it's going to be dangerous or embarrassing or uh, not, it's going to be uh, very, very uncomfortable or awkward and therefore it's going to require you to overcome that in order to love God. So for example, um, if someone is going to, like after the Holocaust, there were many, many Jews who said, I don't want to be Jewish anymore. 
I don't want to be Jewish is a liability. It gets you killed. I don't want to be Jewish anymore. I don't want my, I'm going to change my name. I'm going to get a nose job. I'm going to, you know, go join a, uh, an anti-Semitic, um, you know, country club and uh, become, uh, you know, even, even espouse anti-Semitic things. So no one will think that I'm Jewish because this Jewish thing is very, is a big liability. So in order to be Jewish after the Holocaust, and the same thing with anybody who was uh, born in Russia or, um, or in the former Soviet Union, and growing up there and then coming to America, it's like, I don't want anybody to know I'm Jewish. Being Jewish is a liability. If I finally can come to a country where they don't have to, I don't have to listen to my passport that I'm Jewish, I'm not gonna list Jewish, I don't want anybody to know that I'm Jewish, and so on. But yet, although some Jews did that, and we do not in any way blame or have anything other than compassion for those who, uh, who did change their names or did try to assimilate to the point where they didn't even tell their children they were Jewish. But for the vast majority of us, that's not what happened. Our parents, grandparents, kept on, kept, the, kept their names, kept their noses, uh, kept their Jewish, uh, their, their Jewish identity. And even us, Americans, you know, yeah, of course you're accepted as a, as a Jew, but you know, so much easier to identify as a Christian and, as, and to identify as, as anything but Jewish, or you could identify culturally Jewish, but to, to associate with, with the religion anyway, for many people, that is something that's very, very difficult. So to overcome that is a, is a form of misirat nefesh. Like it's like uh, really dedicating ourselves to, uh, to Hashem, dedicating ourselves to, uh, to God. And so that's overcoming that obstacle to loving God. So that's what, and then the third one, what's the third, uh, the third thing it says there, with all your might, which means all of your physical, material possessions. They can also get in the way, you know, because, uh, you know, people who, um, people who love their, their, their things more than they love God, it becomes, it becomes an obstacle. Because, uh, you know, there's rabbi, you know, I, I would love to come to, uh, to a service. I'd love to come, but I, I can't, I can't. You know, I got, uh, I got this big thing here. I got this big thing there. You know, there's, uh, there's other priorities in my life. You know, I got to make this big deal. I got to, um, and so that becomes also an obstacle. And so that's what, that's what the Mishma is saying. You shall love God despite the fact that you have all these things that are working against your love of God. So the question is, how? How is that possible? You're right. God makes a very good case. It's going to be really hard to overcome uh, this. Uh, to overcome this. So what am I going to do? How, am I, how do we do this? And so that's what he says here. How can physical man attain this level? How is it possible for us to attain this level of love of God that will overcome the obstacles that we that are mentioned. And so this is the answer. It is therefore to this end that the blessing before the Shema called Yotzer Or was introduced first. So this is why God put the, the rabbis put the blessing of the Shema before the Shema. Even though you're right, it really they're they're not they're really separate things and therefore if you didn't say them you should say them at a later time because they stand on their own but the reason they're put in proximity and they're called the blessings of the Shema is because they address this specific issue of how we are going to overcome and we are going to be able to um, stand stronger than these other loves and be able to love God how are we going to be able to put ourselves aside? How can we be so selfless? How can we push ourselves to things that seemingly are impossible? It's all about me and all of these three things. My, my spouse, my children, my life, my home, my money. These are all, this is all me. And then me, 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 me. How do I get over me? How do I put myself aside? And so the answer is, for in this blessing... There is said and repeated at length the account and order of the angels standing at the world's summit in order to proclaim the greatness of the Holy One, blessed be He. 
And then we say how all of them are nullified in his blessed light and pronounce in fear and awe and sanctify and declare in fear, holy, holy, holy. What does that mean, holy? What are the angels saying? So the author of explains what holy means. Holy means that he is apart from them. But these great angels who live in the world of Yitzirah, I'm sorry, in the world of Buria, the highest level of the angels, what do they say? Kadosh, God is apart from me. I don't understand him. I don't get him. I, I, I can see that he's very, very far from me. He does not clothe himself in them in a revealed state. They don't understand God. And they, they understand that. They say God is holy. He is apart from us. Holy, they say it three times. He's very, very, very far from us. But the whole earth is full of his glory. So God is not in heaven. God is not intimate in heaven. There's no intimate relationship between the angels and God. The, the angels have the, um, the advantage that they can appreciate that there is a God. And they don't have any question about whether there is a God or not like we do. They don't struggle with that. They know there is a God and they know how powerful and how great God is. But they know that God is not there. And that's why they say God is apart from me. He's not with us. He does not clothe himself. He is not a present in a revealed state in heaven, in their, in their world. So where is God? The whole earth is full of his glory. What is, where, where on earth is God to be found? Namely, the community of Israel above and Israel below, as has been explained earlier. And so, the angels are saying that God is not in heaven, but where is he? He's down here with us. So too, the Ophanim, which are the next level down, so Bria, the world of Bria is where the, the Srafim, Srafim literally means the ones who burn up in their love of God. And then there are the Ophanim. Ophan means a circle. And then there is the holy chayot. And so the Ophanim and the holy, the Ophanim are in the world of Yitzira, which is the um, one world above ours. And then the holy chayot are in the world of Asiya, the spiritual Asiya. So it's the same world as ours, just a spiritual counterpart. And so they're, low, they're on a lower level. And they, with great thunder, declare, blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. So they don't even say, holy, holy, holy. They, for they neither know nor do they apprehend God's place. As we say, for he alone is exalted and holy. So God is removed so far from these angels, the Ophanim and the Chayot, that they don't even, they can't even say, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. They can't even say, holy, holy, holy. Instead, what do they say? Blessed is God wherever he is. We don't even know where he is. Okay? So he's not with the angels in the world of Berea. He's not with the angels in the world of Yitzira. He's not with the angels in the world of Asiya. Where is he? With us? Are you kidding me? He, the angels, they can't get him. He's not intimate with the angels, but he's intimate with us? Oh my gosh, this is insane. This is crazy. How does he do that? How does he get into our world? You know how far down we are? We are so far from God's God consciousness. It doesn't, that means God has to really, really squeeze himself into a very, very, very narrow place to have this relationship with us. So then follows the second blessing. That with an everlasting love have you loved us, O Lord our God. That is to say that he set aside all the supernal holy hosts and caused his Shekhinah to dwell upon us so that he be called our God in the same sense that he is called the God of Abraham, as explained earlier. So 
uh, a great love. I can just go back to that for a second. I just want to show you the words here. So right here at the beginning, it says, you have loved us, God, our God, with everlasting love. So what is, the, what is the love that you have loved us? That you are our God. You're not the God of the angels. You're not the God of the seraphim. You're not the God of the ofanim or the chayot kodesh. You're our God, like the God of Abraham. You call, you call yourself by, by, by us. You say, yo, I am. I'm their God. I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of the Jewish people. I'm their, I'm their God. So God it comes down here and has this relationship with us that he does not have with anyone else. And so now back here he says, so that with everlasting love have you, O Lord, have you loved us, our O Lord, our God. What does it mean? So that he be called our God in the same sense that he is called the God of Abraham as I explained earlier. This, so how is it possible that God could squeeze himself into this lowest world and be intimate with us? And this is because love impels the flesh, which means that the Talmud tells a story of two of, of rabbis. And the rabbis were um, their girth. Their, uh, their, their weight was, uh, was very, very big. And their waists, their, they were so big, it says, that when they would stand against each other, these two rabbis, that uh, a, a cow could walk underneath them, between them. That's how far apart they were because their stomachs were so big. So the Talmud asks, well, in that case, how were they able to have any children? And the Talmud answers, that love impels the flesh. Meaning, obviously this is not to be taken uh, so literally, it's, uh, it's more of a metaphor, but the idea is that the, the, the flesh being impelled means that people will, are able to uh, do crazy things with their, with their body out of love, like we know that's you know people can squeeze through uh, these windows that are very very small, and they can lift up you know if God forbid uh, someone's under a car, they can lift up the car. In other words, their bodies do pretty crazy things when they have to, and that's because when someone is so committed to someone, so connected to someone, then the love impels the flesh, and so the same thing. God loves us so much that He is willing to put Himself aside for us. That's the love that we, are, that we are experiencing with Hashem, and that's what we're describing in this blessing as we get closer to the Shema. And so as uh, Rabbi, says, I have a question. Yes, Adam. So these prayers that precede the Shema, then, are, are they helping us to sort of intellectualize why we should be lo loving God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our might. Is that the purpose then that we, we begin to understand why exactly. we need to get to that plane? Is that what the Alter Rebbe is trying to explain? Exactly. So what the Alter Rebbe is going to say is that once we acknowledge and appreciate what God has done for us, so now it's easy for us to do the same thing back. So God puts himself aside for us. Now we can put ourselves aside for God. And so instead of only thinking about myself, I can actually, I, I, I feel that someone's being so selfless to me, I could be, I could be selfless back. Does that make sense? That's, that's an extra, it's, it's, what's interesting to me is that that's an exercise of intellect. And yet, what God is asking of us is something other than intellect, right? He's asking us to love him with all of our heart and with all of our might and with all of our soul, but there's no mention of, of intellect. Right, but as we've been learning in the Tanya that it's, it's not the intellect that's going to love God, it's our heart that's going to love God, but the intellect simply points the heart in the right direction. So, right. So, so the, the animal, the dog, is called kelev, which means kuloi lev. He's all heart, right? 
but the dog needs needs direction, you know, or needs training. And so the idea is that that we have all this love inside of us. We just need direction, like where 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 to point it. So the so there is there is creating love. That's called the bonenut, which is the contemplation and meditation that we do in order to to connect with God, and that creates love. And then there is a natural love that we have inside of us that we want to just we just want to uh, you know reveal it. We just want to to set it and you know set it uh, aflame. And so we can do that just by a very simple uh, not a contemplation, but just an awareness. So all we're doing is we're becoming aware. So as soon as I become aware of it, like for example, um, you know, if you um, if you hear someone telling a story and it moves you to tears, right? So you heard it through your head. You didn't you didn't hear it through your heart. You heard it through your head, and your head is overwhelmed by the by by what you just heard, and the, the you start crying or you get you get verklempt, you get all uh, all emotional over it, and so that's the that's the idea of, of, of this. So we're not intellectualizing this. We're simply becoming aware of it. So we're like telling ourselves a story. Let me, let me just tell you a story. Let me tell you what happened in our family. You know, so that's the, that's the idea. Okay. Okay. So this is because love impels the flesh. So therefore it is called avat olam, worldly love. Why is it called worldly love? For this is the so-called contraction, the tzimtzum, of his great and infinite light, taking on the garb of finitude, God has to, in order for God to be with us in this world, God has to garb himself in finitude, which is the smallest possible garment for God. So he's got to literally come down to the lowest world, into our reality, which is called olam, world, which means hiding, which hides God. The word olam means to hide. And so it's in this, so God has to hide himself so much that he can fit into this world. So he has to literally limit himself, meaning obviously um, he doesn't literally limit himself, just his awareness for us is limited. For the sake of the love of his people Israel, in order to bring them near to him, that they might be absorbed in his blessed unity and oneness. So why does God do this? Because he loves us so much and he wants to be one with us. Now, if that doesn't move you, if I tell you that story, that should move you to tears. That should make us start crying and like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. And this is also the meaning of with great and exceeding pity, thou hast thou pitied us. What does it mean exceeding? Namely, exceeding the nearness of God towards all the hosts above. So it's in contrast to the angels. And so that's the idea of, of, the, of, this, of this blessing being a preparation for the Shema because when we can think of the fact that God is doing so much for us or doing so much for this relationship, it releases our heart to love God in that way. And so that is the kind of the... the um, the theme of this chapter, of chapter 49, which is a continuation of 46, 47, and 48, which is that, that when you feel love, when I tell you a story about your grandmother and how she risked her life, or your grandfather, we heard the story from Jerry about her, uh, about her grandfather, and on Friday we heard the story of, uh, of um, Alita's grandfather. When you hear these stories, it's, it just it moves you. These stories move you. So what are the stories we tell ourselves of God? What's the story we tell ourselves of, of our relationship with God? What's the story? This is the story, and we tell the story every single day before we read the Shema. 
because the whole point of the Shema is that we should love the Lord your God with all your heart and, and, and be able to stand up to all the things that would get in the way of that love. What's going to do it? What's going to do it is telling this story. That's why we have to tell the story before the Shema. So we got to tell ourselves this story every single day, and that's why the rabbis put the story before the Shema. What's the story? The story is that God created hosts in the heaven, and he created angels. Now, let me tell you a little bit about these angels. These angels are holy, and they're beautiful, and they're pure, and they're, they're amazing. They, they, um, they know God. They, well, they don't really know where he is, but they, they have an appreciation that there is a God, much more than us. They, they know how to sing to God. They sing so beautifully, and they fear God, and they love God, and you think God would want them because they're easier for access for God. He doesn't have to limit himself so much. But what do the angels say? No, he's not here. Every day, the angels say, where is God? He's not here. He's holy, holy, holy. He's so far removed from us. And he's so far removed from the lower angels, they don't even say holy, holy. <coughs> they don't say anything. They say, Baruch Kippur God is, bless God wherever he is. That's how far away God is from their, 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 their being with them. And so God doesn't choose them. He chooses us over them. I mean, this is just, this is so heartwarming, so moving. And that would move us to therefore say, well, if God could do that for us, then the least I can do for God is to do the same back. And I could love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my might. More, I love him more than, so, so the angels to God would be God's wealth. Maybe like his, uh, you know, his, uh, so, so God says, ah, Wealth. Wealth is good, but I love you more than that. And it's not about me. The angels, they're very good. They're good for me. You know, they, they, they're like pets. They're like my, my uh, they're, they're, they're spiritual pets. They, they, they love me. They, they come running as soon as I come in. And they're, they're, just, they're just wonderful. But nah, that's not what I'm looking for. I want you. Even though it means I have to squeeze into this, I don't want to say a straitjacket, but I, I got to squeeze into this finite world, this avat olam, this, this love of the world, I got to connect with them on this, in this physical plane, I have to go through all this symptom, and I have to limit myself so much in order to have a relationship with them, that's, what I, that's where I want to be, I want to be with them in this world, and go through the symptom. so if God can put himself aside, I can put myself aside, that is the message of the of this, of this blessing. Now, I'm just going to tease you because I'm not, I don't really want to go into it now, but I want to tease you for next week, next Monday night, and that is, he then says that in, the, in this blessing, we say, and you have chosen us from, um, uh, from every people and tongue, which refers to not our soul, because that would be like the angels, it refers to the material body, which in its corporeal aspects is similar to the bodies of the Gentiles of the world. And so when God says, I've chosen you, he says, I chose your body. That's like God is not uniting with our soul. God is uniting with our body. Oh, he's all, not only is he connected with our soul, he's also connected with our body. But in this, in this one, we're talking about how God comes all the way down to be connected with our physical body. And we're going to talk about that next week as to what exactly this chosen means, and what does it mean to be the chosen people, and what does it mean that God chose our material body, um, and why does it have to be similar to the bodies of the Gentiles of the world. So that's going to be our cliffhanger or our teaser for uh, for next week's soul soul workout to explore that but let's go a little bit further and he says and thou has brought us near to give thanks the interpretation of thanks will be given elsewhere and proclaim your unity to be absorbed into his blessed unity as has been explained above that's the purpose of creation why God come down here so when the intelligent person will reflect on these matters in the depths of his heart and brain, 
then as surely as water mirrors the image of a face, his soul will spontaneously be kindled and it will clothe itself in a spirit of benevolence, willingly to lay down and resolutely to abandon all he possesses in order only to cleave unto God, may he be blessed and to be absorbed into his light with an attachment and longing and so forth in the manner in a manner of osculation, nishikin, kisses, and the attachment of spirit to spirit, as has been explained earlier. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. This kind of reminds me like of every uh, of many uh, Hollywood films or books out there that um, you know somebody has a love and then someone else comes along and they abandon everything and they go off with their with their lover um, which usually is not a very positive thing because they uh, they're usually in a you know in a marriage and that marriage is now being broken which is a very very bad thing but let's reverse that and say that the marriage that we're talking about here is where someone is married to materialism and they're they're married to themselves and then they're just they 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 come in into they, they come become aware of the love that Hashem has for them and they abandon their marriage to their materialism and they abandon their their attachment to their their their, their narcissism and their attachment to themselves and they run you know uh, to 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 God that's that's the image that's the image that uh, that comes to mind when you read this chapter of the Tanya when you read this part of the Tanya of this just this abandonment of, of 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 everything else and go that's not really important compared to uh, compared to this 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 love is is supreme now what we're going to learn is okay so now how do you how do you express that love you express that love by abandoning your family by abandoning your wife and abandoning your children or running off to a yeshiva somewhere and study 24 hours a day and to uh, is that the way you do it and the answer is not if you're running towards God if you're running towards God then it's your then it's your family that now ha takes precedence over you because you have a responsibility to your family and you have a responsibility to your children and to your spouse and you don't run you don't throw your money away you use your money very carefully to to do things with it to to further Hashem's causes and you don't just to just give your life up and just die you you live with the sirat nefesh you're willing to overcome any obstacle in order to to do what needs to be done and so that's really the you know it, it's kind of flipping the whole thing and i'll just end with this story that uh, I've, I've shared it on rosh hashani and kipper before and i've heard it from others sharing it um it's uh it's a it's a very it's a very cute story of the of the fellow who's out and, uh, and he's at, at the end of his rope and he turns to God and he says, you know, God, I, I need a life. I got no life. I got nothing. I'm, I'm at the end of my rope. I'm, I'm ready to, to throw it all in. And so God says, no problem. I'll give you a new life. I'll give you a life. But uh, you're going to have to give me everything you got in your, everything you got in your pocket. He says, well, all I got is 20 bucks. He says, okay, give me 20 bucks. Okay, but uh, God, if I if I if I give you uh, twenty bucks, I, I won't have money to for any gas to, to put into my car. So, oh, 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 you have a car. Well, in that case, I'll take the twenty bucks and I'll take the car and I'll give you a new life. It's like, but but if I if I if I don't have a car, I won't be able to get to get to work. It's like, oh, you have a job? Ha! Huh. Well, in that case, it'll be twenty bucks. It'll be your car and your job, and then I'll give you a new life. I give you a life. He's like, well, if I don't have a job, then I'm going to lose my house. So, oh, you have a house. Okay, well, in that case, I'm going to need the 20 bucks. I'm going to need your car. I'm going to need your job. And I'm going to need your house. He's like, well, if I don't have a house, I'm going to for my family. I'm like, whoa, you've got a family. Well, in that case, I'm going to need the 20 bucks. need your car. need your job. need your house. I need your family. Well, at this point, he turns to God and he says, well, 
I need a new life. He gives God a 20 bucks. He gives him the house. He gives him his job. He gives him his family. And God turns around to him and says, okay, now I'm giving you a new life. Here's your new life. Here's 20 bucks. Go fill up your car with gas. Go to your job and your house. And take care of your family because your life is no longer about you because you've given it to me. I'm giving you a new life. And this is not your money. It's my money. It's not your family. It's my family. It's not your house. It's my house. It's not your car. It's my car. And you're going to use all of these things the way I want you to use them. So you're going to take care of your family. You're going to take care of your job. You're going to take care of your community. And that's going to be your new life. And so the idea is that we have everything. So the, the dedication to God, the love of God, doesn't mean the abandonment of our family. It means the abandonment of our selfish investment in our family, our selfish investment in our money, our selfish investment in our house and in our life and in all those things. So that's all we're that's all we're giving up. We're not giving up anything else. God doesn't want us to. You're not allowed to give more than 20% of your money away to charity, unless of course you're Bill Gates and or something like that. But uh, you just can't give all your money away to charity and become destitute. You're not allowed. You know, there's 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 um, limitations on how on how you can give charity. Um, you can, you, you, technically, you can give more than twenty percent. That it's not going to make you poor and it's not going to uh, impoverish you. So it, there, there's ways of giving more, but there's there's rules to it. And that's because it's not about abandoning self. It's about embracing God, who then reframes your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your children in a much, much deeper, much more profound profound way. As I told the story before, as the Rebbe said, that his time with with his, with his Rebbetzin was as important as putting on tefillin. So now, not only does he have a mitzvah putting on tefillin, he now has a mitzvah every day to spend time with his wife. You know, that's, that's called being ultra, you know, when people say you're ultra-Orthodox, that we say, yes. You know what ultra-Orthodox means? It means I'm ultra- dedicated to my wife. I'm ultra dedicated to my children. I'm ultra dedicated to kindness of other people and taking care of other people. So ultra doesn't just mean that I'm ultra careful about putting on tefillin. I have to equally be as careful about putting on my tefillin as I am about spending time with my wife every day and spending time with my children every day. And by the way, it's, 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 it's uh, usually easier to put on tefillin every day than it is to spend time with your spouse every day and make sure to be there for your children in the real way. And so, which the mitzvah that's harder is always the mitzvah that's more important. And so, uh, these are these are really really important ideas. And this is a very beautiful insight into the blessing of the Shema. And so, to uh, to recap, the reason why we have these blessings before the Shema is that when we realize how much God puts up the tzimtzum that God has to go through in order to come down and be with us, that motivates us that we should do everything and be, do the symptom to our, to our selfishness, to our ego, to put a, put a cap on it and to uh, put it in its place and be able to really dedicate ourselves to God the way God wants us to and be able to do that not by doing too much contemplation but by just telling the story. Any questions, comments, thoughts? I'm going to answer at once. Thank you, Rabbi. I left everybody speechless. <laughs> it's rare. Yes. <laughs> you create a high bar for all of us to live up to, but it's very inspiring. A very, uh -huh. very nice class tonight. Very nice. Lots to think about. Yes. I'm just quiet thinking about what you said, too. It's a perfect uh, setup for Wednesday night when we talk about yeah. marriage. Yes. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Good. We're going to try to also talk about uh, the, the, the people who aren't married. And yeah. uh, 
Hello. <laughs> and, and relationships and the difficulty and the challenge of, of, uh, of, of COVID for, uh, for people who are in that space. So we're definitely going yes. to try to give everybody a, some tools to what to do I during the time. Not meant to be. <laughs> I don't know. Michael, I see you unmute yourself. Michael Kaufman, Michael K. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. It's uh, it's not trivial. Like it needs time to yeah. to think about it. It does. Yeah. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I think this is this is very interesting. You you, you say responsibility, but uh, some other people I've heard say obligation. And I think what's fascinating is this stands in contrast to what's going on outside where people are imposing my right, okay, my rights and the violation of my rights versus what am I obligated to the community? What should I do? How could I be a better person? And I think what a, I, I think what a wonderful thing to uh, when when everything is chaotic is what is my obligation to my family, to my spouse, to the people, to my community, and so on. What is my obligation versus what are my rights that are being infringed and so on? I think it's a, it's such a beautiful thing. That's it. Wow. Yes. Now I'm well, muting. Well said, Tim. Well said. Thank you. That was very nice. Appreciate that. That was very, very good. Yep. Anybody else want to... Uh, Share anything? We got Gabby, we got Janet, Ina, Nancy, Leonard. Well, <laughs> well, with that, we'll uh, we'll call it a night. Tomorrow night, there's the uh, Torah class. Make sure to join for that. And Wednesday night, we're going to have the rabbi, a therapist, and a doctor walk onto a Zoom. So we look forward to that. And we'll see you then. Until then, have a good night. And good Thank night. you, Rabbi. Good night, Thank everybody. Thank you, Thank you, Rabbi. Good night. Good night, Thank everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Good night.